previously on Strange Detectives. I want to talk about China Mielville's pretty popular The City and the City, but I also want to talk about Jeff Vandermeer's Finch. But honestly, what ever happened to new weird fiction? 100,000 word posting battle. These threads run hot. Seen such a useless prick as Keanu Reeves in Point Break. Mm -hmm gatekeeping much? Jeffrey, you cheeky, cheeky boy. You wrote the Southern Reach trilogy, and they made a movie about that where Natalie Portman talks to a bear woman. Uh, could we maybe not idolize Helter Skelter as the jumping off point for a little bit of fun escapism? Because that's like half of YA book talk these days. But then I remember that I'm an idiot, so the new weird is dead. Uh, but weird fiction lives on. Hello, and welcome to Strange Detectives, uh, a YouTube channel about strange and unusual detective fiction. Uh, my name is Xavier, and I'm super excited to finally be talking about two pieces of new weird detective fiction that are both near and dear to my heart. Uh, I really want to talk about China Mielville's The City in the City and Jeff Vandermeer's Finch, and I promise you that I will eventually be talking about these books. Uh, but not just yet. Because you may have noticed that I'm filming this week from a slightly different location than I normally do, uh, which means that I've lost my background of beautiful, slightly out of focus bookshelves. Um, and without my bookshelves, you know, am I even a booktuber anymore? They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine, but you just can't. The reason for this disturbing development is that I recently moved to Tucson. Uh, I just got a new place and I ordered a couch. Um, and I swear to God, I, you know, I checked all of the measurements online, I used my tape measure, uh, and all of the reviews said that uh, the couch is way smaller in person than it appears in the photographs. Which for me is fine, because, you know, my place isn't that big. But then the couch arrived, uh, and I am horrified to discover that the couch is in fact much, much larger than I thought it'd be. Uh, and I'm sure for most of you, you know, this would be a pleasant surprise. Um, but it's really thrown a monkey wrench into my otherwise meticulously planned sense of home decor. Because now the only space large enough in my apartment for the couch happens to be the one wall where the bookshelves are. Uh, and so the only way to put the couch there would be to break up the bookshelves. Um, and I've had these same bookshelves since I was like 19, uh, and I have never once broken them up. Um, and it seems cruel both to the bookshelves and to me, uh, to split them up. So originally I tried floating the couch in front of the bookshelves, um, which apartment therapy assures me is very, very trendy. Uh, and you know, I get that. It seems kind of decadent, uh, but I can do decadent. You know that scene in Gatsby uh, where Owl Eyes is examining the library and he's like freaking out, you know, he's like, it's a triumph, and he didn't even cut the pages. I think that floating your couch in front of your bookshelves is like the 21st century equivalent of a Gatsby library. So I tried floating the couch, uh, but it was a complete disaster. It did not last 24 hours. Um, it was driving me completely insane. I do not understand this idea that I have books that I cannot access, or if I want to access them, I have to move furniture? Yeah, thanks apartment therapy, uh, but no thanks. So anyway, this is the state of my apartment right now, uh, which means that I am book shelfless until I can figure this out. But before you take my booktube license away, uh, I thought I'd make it up to you, you know, try to reestablish my bona fides as a booktuber. Um, I thought we could do a quick book haul. I don't really plan on doing lots of like book hauls or unhauls on this channel. Uh, not because I have anything against them. Uh, God knows I watch way too many of them. Um, but honestly, my style of acquiring books is so haphazard and uncoordinated, uh, I just don't think I could ever get anything together like that. Um, and also, if a book arrives for me in the mail, uh, there is literally no way I am waiting to open it uh, so I can film it. Um, some of you people have way more patience than I do. But I had an experience this week where I acquired a book, uh, a single book, um, but I've got to say, like, the circumstances from start to finish, uh, this was one of the strangest ways I've acquired a book uh, in a very, very long time. Possibly ever. Uh, anyways, I thought I'd share it, um, because I'm curious to know what you think about this. Okay, so, like I said, uh, I recently moved to Tucson, uh, maybe a month ago. Um, and I love it. Tucson's great. 
However, the other day I had to go to the post office. Um, so I get in my car and I drive downtown uh, and I feed a single nickel into the meter um, because, you know, I know it's just going to be a minute. Anyways, I go inside and everything goes smoothly. Uh, no lines, I'm in and out, wham bam, thank you ma'am. Um, and I'm back with plenty of time to spare. And of course, I get back to my car uh, and there's the meter maid, you know, scanning my license plates with his little ray gun or whatever he does. Uh, and I was like, you've got to be kidding me. You know, I've still got four minutes on this bad boy. And he looks at me and he says, sorry, sir, uh, but you've pulled nose in to a back in only parking spot. Now, before you think I'm an idiot, first of all, there wasn't a single other car on this street, you know? It's not like I drove past a bunch of other cars that had backed into their spots and like I couldn't take the hint. Second of all, back in only parking spots? I guess this is like a Tucson thing and they're all like this? Uh, but I've lived in like half a dozen major American cities and I have never once heard of a back in only parking space. Can someone please explain the logic of this to me? Like, isn't it more dangerous somehow? Whatever, the guy giving me the ticket was having none of this. He was just like, you gotta read the signs, man. Which, all right, fair. So I get back in my car to drive home and you know, I'm just fuming. Uh, just getting angrier and angrier about this gross misconduct of justice. Uh, I'm worked up into a total frothing rage when I remember that I have to drive past a Bookman's used bookstore on my way home. Uh, and so I slam the brakes and I whip the car into the Bookman's parking lot and I decide that I'm going to cure my rage uh, with a little retail therapy. I don't know if it was the anger or the rage or what, uh, but the Bookman's selection was really hitting. Um, I don't know if you've ever been to a Bookman's. I think they're like a local chain out here, uh, but they're pretty nice and they have like full on shopping carts inside the store. And I'm just so angry at this point that, you know, I'm literally going up and down the aisles with a grocery cart, just loading up. Uh, you know, disgusting. Uh, there was like a penguin collection of Neo Marsh mysteries. Uh, there's a leather bound volume of W. Somerset Maugham. Uh, but honestly, I wasn't even checking prices. I wasn't reading the backs of some of these books. You know, anything that caught my eye into the cart. Um, just like a pure, blind, rage induced consumption. Uh, completely disgusting. And when my disgusting appetite is finally sated, I go up to the counter and I'm waiting in line and I start to get that sick feeling in the pit of my stomach. Like, what are you doing? You know, you're making such a stupid life choice right now. Uh, you just spent way too much money on a couch uh, and it's too big for your space and now you've got to put your books in your bathtub or something and you just got this parking ticket uh, because you pulled a nose into a backing only parking space and you're gonna double down on all of this? Uh, by buying a bunch of books, you know, half of which I already own, and half of which, honestly, I'll probably never finish. So I get to the counter, uh, and you know, I feel really bad about this, um, because it's such a shitty thing to do. Uh, but I was like, look man, I think I may have bitten off more than I can chew here. Um, I'm gonna have to put some of these books back. Uh, and you know, I offered to reshelve them, but obviously he doesn't want me to do that. Uh, and he was very gracious about it. And he said, no, man, it's not a problem. Don't worry about it. But I didn't want to walk away, you know, empty handed. Uh, so I said, I would like this one book here. Um, and I pulled out this book, Richard Crompton's Hour of the Red God. Uh, and here's the stinger. A compulsive whodunit set in Kenya where tribal politics can get you killed. Which I mean, yeah, I gotta have that, right? A compulsive whodunit set in Kenya where tribal politics can get you killed? And so he takes the book and he scans it and I give him my credit card and then he tells me, congratulations, sir. You're today's lucky winner. Your purchase is completely free. I was completely floored, you know, because I had never heard of such a thing. Uh, so I made him explain it to me like two or three times before I understood what was going on. Um, but yeah, it's true. Apparently at every Bookman's location every day, they select one random customer uh, and their tab is completely comped. Um, unlimited, the entire purchase, just for free. And at first, you know, I couldn't believe my good luck uh, because, you know, a small victory like that, you can really ride that high for the rest of the day. Uh, but then both the cashier and I turn and look at the massive pile of books 
I had just set aside to be reshelved. Uh, and I must not have been able to control the look of absolute abject horror that overtook my face. Uh, because he just looked at me and shook his head and grinned, and he said, Shoulda got those books, man. Oh, You shoulda got those books, man. Yeah, I shoulda got those books, man. Brutal. Did I win? Did I lose? Uh, who can say? Uh, all I know is that now I have an oversized couch and a parking ticket to pay off, um, and my apartment looks like this. But also, I have Richard Crompton's Hour of the Red God. Uh, so who knows, if it's any good and it's strange, maybe it will make its way back on this channel. It better be good. So anyway, that's my Strange Detectives book haul. Uh, a real roller coaster of highs and lows. Uh, I'm not really sure how I feel about it. All right, so enough beating around the bush. Uh, we can finally talk about some strange detective novels on strange detectives. Um, it's about time. Now, last week on this channel, I went on a little bit of a goose chase, uh, and I talked about the rise and fall of the new weird literary movement. Um, and at the center of this discussion was a series of flame wars that took place in the early 2000s amongst a group of British writers uh, who are all trying to hash out, you know, what is new weird fiction and whether or not it's worth pursuing. And this was a massive debate, as we saw, that ran some 100,000 words and took place over the course of many months, uh, during which time these writers bickered over basically every genre or subgenre under the sun. Um, in fact, here's just a list of a few of the genres that get mentioned during the early new weird debates. Weird fiction, new weird fiction, new wave, new wave with two O's, next wave, new wave fabulism, magical realism, cyberpunk, fantastica, slipstream, hard sci-fi, soft sci-fi, overclocked fiction, German expressionism, surrealism, surreal cityscapism, postmodern fiction and anti-postmodern fiction. If you were very observant and you watched last week's video, you may have noticed uh, that not one time did the words detective or detective fiction ever come up in my video. Uh, and that's not an accident, because nowhere, 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 nowhere in this massive sprawling debate does detective fiction ever once come up as a, a subject worth serious conversation. Uh, in fact, I did a control F of the entire 100,000 word archives, um, and I can only find one mention of detective fiction, and that's a passing reference where Cheryl Morgan is making fun of it. Uh. You didn't think I could have been serious about publishing cat detective books, did you? Come on, Cheryl, why do you have to say these hurtful things? I mean, seriously, what did Lillian Jackson Braun ever do to you? And this simple fact that all of these writers could spend so much time, you know, a year in this bloody battle, nitpicking over every genre and niche under the sun, uh, and not once discuss detective fiction? It's maddening. I mean, it drives me absolutely crazy. Uh, and it's even crazier when you consider that, you know, China Mielville and Jeff Vandermeer, who are basically like the Romulus and Remus of the new weird literary movement, uh, both of these writers published detective fiction. Um, Mielville's most famous work is a piece of detective fiction. Uh, and yet it never comes up as a matter of serious conversation. And I think, and this is only my theory, but I think that this kind of proves my point that detective fiction is the king of genre fiction. You know, in my very first video on this channel, uh, I made the claim that detective fiction is unique amongst genre fiction insofar as detective fiction is structurally rigid. Uh, detective fiction has rules. All of these other genres, well, they're really more about feelings, aren't they? You know, the only reason we can have these ridiculous sprawling debates is it fantasy? Is it sci-fi? You know, is it grimdark urban solar punk? Uh, these debates only get off the ground because these genres are essentially spineless. You know, they have no backbone. They have no rule sets. But detective fiction has a rule set. Uh, now, you can play with these rules and you can bend these rules. Uh, and if you're very, very talented, you can even break these rules sometimes. But at the very least, you must tacitly acknowledge these rules. You can't ignore them. Uh, because if you do, then it simply isn't detective fiction anymore. Simple as. If you don't like it, there's the door. 
you know, do not pass go, do not collect $200. Now, if you don't believe me, or you think I'm being harsh or hyperbolic, uh, then I think it is interesting to consider the two new weird novels that I want to talk about today. Um, because despite the high-flying rhetoric about, you know, smashing the gatekeepers or dissolving genre boundaries forever, um, and all this talk of a revolution, when it comes to their detective fiction, uh, I mean, both of these writers play it right down the middle. Uh, this is about as straight as straight detective fiction as you can get. Okay, so let's start with Mielfel's The City and the City, first published in 2009. Um, do I even need to talk about this book? I mean, is there anyone out there who hasn't read it? Uh, the City and the City got Mielvil a Hugo Award and like a World Fantasy Prize and an Arthur C. Clarke Medal, um, which, you know, is basically about as celebrated as a piece of genre fiction can get these days. Uh, and there was even a BBC adaptation at one point. Um, so, you know, it's highly regarded, and if you haven't read it, go read it. It's great. Uh, you'll probably love it. The premise of the novel is that somewhere vaguely Central or Eastern European, um, I always thought it was like the Balkans, uh, but it doesn't really matter. Um, somewhere there are these two rival city-states. One city is called Bejel, and one city is called Ulcomo. And you know, they have like different cultures and different languages and different religions and different aesthetics, but there's a twist. And the twist is that these two cities actually occupy the same geographic space. So from the outside, you know, it looks like there's only one city, but on the inside, there are actually two cities coexisting. And the citizens of these two cities, uh, they take their separate identities extremely seriously. They practice what they call unseeing, uh, where basically the idea is that, you know, if you're a citizen of El Como, you only ever interact with other citizens from El Como, uh, and you unsee or consciously ignore all of the citizens from the other city. They take this idea of unseeing to the absolute extreme. Uh, so if you're from El Como, it's not just that you ignore the citizens from Bejel, you ignore everything Bejel. You know, you unsee their shop fronts or their street signs. Uh, if you're looking at the traffic on the street, you only see the El Comen cars and you actively ignore or unsee all of the Bej cars. And if you do happen to notice a Bej car, you know, say like a Bej car veers off the road and threatens to run you over and you dive out of the way, well, technically you just committed a breach. Um, which is this like huge taboo in this society. Uh, it's a real violation of the rules and you can get in a lot of trouble for it, um, even if it's to like save your own life. And you know, this is a really fun setting for a detective novel uh, because you know, even if you haven't read it, you can probably already guess the general outline of the plot. Uh, basically in the first act, a dead body from El Como shows up in Bejel and Inspector Borlu, who's from Bejel, has to travel to El Como to help with the investigation. Uh, and like I said, this is lots of fun because, you know, Inspector Borlu, he has to like go to this checkpoint and get his passport stamped and, you know, get his visa signed. Uh, and then he crosses over the checkpoint. And of course, to us, he's in like the exact same city. But for him, it's this like whole new foreign exotic place. Um, because once he's on the other side of the checkpoint, he has to start unseeing all of the Bejel things he was used to seeing and start seeing all of the El Como things he's been actively ignoring his entire life. And you know, you also get this really fun buddy cop dynamic, right? Because the El Comen detective and the Bej detective have to work together to find the killer. Uh, and you know, all of the usual hijinks ensue and they're constantly like traveling back and forth between the two cities by, you know, unseeing one city and then seeing the next city and then unseeing that city and then going back by seeing the old city again. Uh, and like I said, it's lots of fun. Now, before I went down all of these different rabbit trails, uh, I had originally planned on making just one video dedicated to the city and the city. Uh, but I happened to be rereading Jeff Vandermeer's Finch at the same time, and I was really struck by the similarities between these two books. Um, so I thought it might be interesting to compare them side by side. Uh, because not only are both books, you know, urban detective fiction published in 2009 by British male new weird authors, which, you know, is a pretty neat coincidence, I guess. Uh, but Vandermeer's Finch is also about two rival city-states that coexist in the same geographic location. 
Only, instead of two rival ethnic factions, uh, Vandermeer's Finch takes place in the Ambergris universe, which is a collection of novels and novellas and short stories, uh, including The City of Saints and Mad Men and Shriek, all of which document the violent history between a city of human beings and mushroom people. That's right, I said mushroom people, uh, because Ambergris is pure fungal punk. Um, basically, the city of Ambergris is like this colony that was founded on top of this underground race of mushroom people called the Grey Caps. Uh, and the Grey Caps are constantly like coming above ground and intruding and disrupting the lives of Ambergris. And there's simply no way I can do justice to how exquisitely mushroomy all of these books are. Uh, however mushroomy you think a book can be, you're gonna have to double it. Um, because the mushrooms are like everywhere in Ambergris. Everything is covered in fungus, and there's all of these spores caked on top of everything. Uh, and all of the technology is like mushroom-based. Uh, so the detectives in the novel, their guns fire like fungus bullets. Um, and when they want to send inter-office memos, they use these like gooey seed pods that they have to cut open. You know, I recently reread the entire Ambergris collection, uh, and I had forgotten just how much I really do love these books. Um, I think I might have grown cold on some of Vandermeer's more recent writing, uh, but Ambergris is so strange and so beautiful and so mushroomy uh, that it reminded me just how much I really do love Jeff Vandermeer and his writing. Now, because these books have so many uh, superficial similarities, I really want to do like a compare and contrast of the two novels. Um, but I also really want to talk about their strengths and weaknesses as detective fiction. Uh, so as always, we've reached that point in the video um, where we will ask the most important question, which we will always try to ask and answer on this channel. Uh, and that is, are the mysteries any good? And here, my answer is surprising, uh, even to me. Um, because if you had asked me before my latest reread of both of these novels which was the superior, I would have just said The City and the City, hands down. Uh, it would have been an almost knee-jerk reaction, I think. Uh, because The City and the City is so universally well-regarded, um, and so uncontroversially considered a modern masterpiece, that it just seems obvious it's the better book. And Finch, by contrast, um, well, it's certainly less renowned. Uh, and in fact, the entire Ambergris saga was originally only published, like, online or by micropresses. Um, and it's getting a lot of love now, and yeah, it's got this beautiful FSG reprint, and I love that. Uh, but I suspect that this is largely due to the strength and popularity of the Southern Reach trilogy. Uh, and had that series not caught on the way it did, um, you know, I doubt we'd think about Ambergris as anything more than, like, a minor oddity. But rereading them this time, uh, I was surprised to discover how lukewarm my reaction was to The City in the City, uh, and just how much I thought there was to be critical of. And I was also surprised by how genuinely captivated I was by Finch, uh, and just how much fun I had reading it. Um, so, you know, maybe I've gotten it wrong this whole time. Uh, and if I have, then maybe everyone has. Because, you know, let's face it, for a piece of new weird fiction, uh, The City in the City isn't actually that weird. Um, it's beautiful, it's haunting, it's evocative, it's atmospheric, it's charming, uh, but there's nothing weird about it. Uh, and in fact, once you get past the central premise, it's pretty much like a paint-by-numbers police procedural. Um, in fact, Mielville plays it so close to the vest, you know, he plays it so straight, that I'm not even sure that this technically qualifies as a piece of strange detective fiction. You know, Mielville isn't playing with the rules of detective fiction here. He's not bending them. Uh, he's certainly not breaking them. And I'm going to go out on a limb here and suggest that this lack of weirdness may in part explain why the novel was so well received in the first place. Uh, because this is certainly Melville's most accessible work. Um, you know, there's a reason why the BBC chose to adapt The City and the City and not Perdido Street Station. Furthermore, I don't think the mystery in The City and the City is all that great. Um, you know, this is just my channel, and this is just my opinion, but I kind of think that the whole third act falls apart. Uh, you know, at one point in the novel, there's this idea raised of a third city inside of the other two cities, unseen by the other two cities. Um, and this is an idea that is dynamite, you know? I mean, it has so much potential, uh, but nothing ever really comes of it. Uh, it's mostly used as, like, a red herring. And at the time, I remember everyone gushing about Mielville's atmospherics, you know? 
uh, all of the reviewers were enthusiastic that Mielville had established this like twisted third man noir. You know, like a Graham Greene, middle European urban thriller marked by gloomy cynicism. But rereading it, um, I was hard pressed to find anything cynical to this book at all. Uh, in fact, it seemed almost quaintly optimistic. You know, this idea of two societies coexisting, choosing to ignore each other in order to preserve the common peace, um, well, this seems downright utopian in contrast to how these civil conflicts actually play out all around the globe every day. Sure, unseeing might not be the multicultural cosmopolitan ideal, uh, but it's also strange to me that Mielville, who's a famous Marxist in his own way, uh, and even wrote like a PhD thesis on the failures of the neoliberal international order, um, well, why is a writer like that so invested in an ideal like cosmopolitanism for its own sake? Now, Finch, on the other hand, uh, that is the truly cynical book, because Vandermeer really does capture the violence that governs the dynamics that play out between the community and the other. You know, Vandermeer's created this race of mushroom people, and they're like a textbook definition of uncanniness, or the uncanny. And he uses this uncanniness to drive home the point that there's like a real, actual terror that governs the relationship between these two cities. Um, because these are oftentimes very violent and very, very ugly books deliberately ugly books. Uh, and this violence is constantly erupting and then dissipating, you know, a lot like mushrooms. Um, so you'll get these long stretches of normalcy, or near normalcy, which are then punctuated by these ecstatic violent episodes, you know, almost like orgies of violence. And this is true cynicism, I'd argue. And it's also much more honest, um, because really there's no reason why the gray caps and the humans of Ambergris can't coexist peacefully. Only they can't. There's too much history in Ambergris. Um, some of the colonial settlers of the city slaughtered some of the Grey Caps early on, um, and the Grey Caps made some of the citizens of Ambergris accidentally disappear. And it's suggested that this is all the result of like a misunderstanding or a miscommunication, but that's exactly the point, isn't it? Uh, true communication is always going to be impossible with the other. Um, and so this history, it hangs over Ambergris, and it dooms them, essentially. You know, they're basically forced to keep repeating this cycle of purges and genocide and violence um, in perpetuity. And Vandermeer actually takes this cynicism one step further, because over the course of his investigation, Detective Finch is constantly moving in and out of these, like, underground circles. He's constantly mixing it up with these smugglers and thieves, and rebels, and soldiers of fortune, and mercenaries, and all of these factions are at war with each other over, like, the pettiest of rivalries. But it doesn't matter how petty or ridiculous these disputes seem, um, because the past, once again, just hangs over Ambergris. They're impossible to escape, and the past is impossible to overcome. So that you quickly discover that it's the humans of Ambergris who are the true enemy of themselves, and not the Grey Caps. Also, I think that Finch has the better mystery of the two books. Uh, the mystery of Finch hinges on like an intertextual or metatextual device, um, and if you like that sort of thing, and I love that sort of thing, then yeah, I think Finch is the better mystery by a mile. I should note that Finch isn't beyond criticism. Uh, while Vandermeer's language is oftentimes gorgeous and baroque and truly weird and truly original, uh, there are times when even I will admit that the dialogue can be a little clunky. Um, and also, there are a couple of sex scenes which, I don't know, they're all a little cringe, aren't they? Um, has there ever been a well-written sex scene in a detective novel? Maybe that would be a good subject for a future video. <laughs> no, it wouldn't. That's a terrible idea. So, there you go. Uh, two detective novels, both weird, neither one particularly strange. Uh, which is life, I guess. Um, if you've read either one of these books, uh, please leave a comment. I'd love to know what you think of them. I'm particularly curious about people who have recently reread The City in the City, uh, because I wonder if it's actually aged as poorly as I think it has. Um, and also, if anyone out there has read The Hour of the Red God by Richard Crompton, uh, please let me know if it's any good. Um, I'm scared to start reading it because I'm afraid it's not going to be. Uh, but if it is and it's strange, I'm sure we'll see it again on this channel. 
So if there's nothing else, uh, the books are The City and the City and Finch. My name is Xavier, this is Strange Detectives, and I'll see you next week. Those nails.